Hi, I'm Adam Rose. I am the creator of Corollary. It is a four-issue miniseries coming out through SourcePoint Press. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at AdamRose74 or on Instagram at ShazamCap. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator and writer and all-around amazing person in his own right. Uh, he's a, a good friend of Raylan Grant as well, who was on the show in the past too. And we'll ask about a couple of stories about him and Raylan and how they met and all the other stuff. We are talking with the ever-talented Adam Rose, creator of Corollary. How are you doing today? Hello, I'm, I'm great. And yes, indeed, do I have some <laughs> wild stories when we do want to talk about Raylan and myself. I might surprise you by one of our Part of our origin story. We'll, we'll save that for, for a little later sure. on here. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, of course, what are you bringing to Two Geeks Talking today? So as you already mentioned, I, I'm a writer, a comic book writer, but I write other types of prose as well. Um, but in particular right now, what I've been beyond excited about and been working my butt off on for the last gosh, over four years as far as the whole process from start to finish. And that's Corollary, which is a science fiction fantasy epic romp four-issue mini miniseries that's out with uh, SourcePoint Press. Uh, issue three came out this past Wednesday. Issue four is going to be coming at us July 20th, and that's the, the final issue of the arc. I say that because could it go on? It sure could. But is it a uh, satisfying story in these four issues? 100%. Oh, nice. I, I love that. Uh, Sci-fi epics are always amazing because it lets you kind of explode your imagination yeah. and tell amazing stories that have no real rules, per se, other than that it's in sometimes in space, sometimes with laser guns. 100 million percent. And, you know, I'm glad you touched on that because I have been a comic book person since I was a little kid, since the first time my grandfathers got me comics at a local store. And those two did not know Teen Titans from the X-Men, but they just somehow knew that this was going to be great for me. Yeah, no, as far as this story and just the whole genre of science fiction, and I say science fiction fantasy, and maybe initially I didn't realized that's what I was blending on my own, just thought, thought science fiction, but enough people have pointed out to me that there's, and I definitely would say I'm heavily influenced. I remember as also like watching, uh, you remember the animated film, uh, Heavy Metal? Oh yeah. So, you know, that is, I think in a way, a, a blending of epic fantasy and science fiction. Why do I say that? Because like my main character, I mean, Andromeda and Cass, they sometimes suit up in what looks like something straight out of Conan the Barbarian, <laughs> but they're in space and are they simultaneously in the first issue. They are on their way to a planet or uh, Andromeda is on her way to a planet to um, talk about the fact that she has somehow survived the twin death because that is the, the initial premise of this whole story in this it's a galaxy of twins, predominantly twins of all shapes and sizes from aliens to human, to planets, everyone has a twin. And if your twin dies, so do you. Wow. And somehow, some way, Andromeda has escaped this twin death. And the galaxy wants to know how and why. And on her way to an engagement to talk about it, she happens to have to save uh, two dinosaur floating dinosaur dragons with cities on their backs uh, because uh, one's giving birth. I kind of think that in itself kind of gives us that that fantasy sci-fi blend. And as you said earlier on, it's in this genre, you you have permission to just say yes to everything and anything. And I would say that as well, like yes to that in the genre, but also just in the realm of getting to create comic books. I mean, there, you know, what's the budget? Yes. Oh, don't get me, you know, we could have a whole like conversation, I'm sure you have about the whole like just getting like indie comics out there and whatever. But what I'm talking about as far as budget compared to like, you know, any giant film that's like hundreds of millions of dollars because of all the special effects, we can do that all. We can say yes to everything. There's no like, oh, geez, I don't know if we can have 
um, a giant uh, city on top of a dinosaur in space. That's going to be too hard for our CGI guys to get, get their minds around, and we already have it budgeted for this laser uh, shooting scene. That's not an issue. You know, at its heart, too, I, I just got to back up here and say, with all the bombastic action, with all the epic like science fiction moments in this story and the planet hopping, galaxy hopping, you name it, at its heart, it's about family too. I mean, it's about this person figuring out who they are, um, what is their relationship to their family, what does family mean to them? And I think right now that is, you know, such a important subject matter because the definition is evolving and flowing for everyone. Good science fiction makes sure to talk, have touchstone moments that do connect to the real world, to the here and now. I mean, I've just gotten into Star Trek Discovery. Oh, yeah. I was, um, you know, I was a huge Trek person from, for a long time ago, and I hadn't tried these new shows because I don't know what was the last one that kind of just didn't do it for me. Maybe it was Enterprise. That was a long time ago. People kept telling me for the last three years, you got to try Discovery. You got to try it. And I tried it, and it's great and some people are complaining social media has its beautiful parts and its very ugly parts and i guess we're seeing that more than ever uh in the recent news uh this week i guess you know people complain about it being like too woke or something which is absurd because star trek in the 60s was an outcry of social issues i mean it's just amazing to me how people are have these blinders on about what something should be I mean, you can not like a story. You can not like some acting. That's fine. But don't like kind of accuse something of being too politicizing or whatever. That's absurd. Like science fiction goes there and always has gone there. And I'm not saying corollary does a lot. It's not heavy handed or anything, but I guess just back to my original point about it really being about this character and their relationship to their sister, to their family and to the rest of the universe and how they're navigating their sense of self. Like, who are they? And what does it mean to be an individual versus part of something larger? Fandoms are fickle, plain and simple. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, yeah. my, my Little Pony for that matter, whatever sure. the case may be. The ability to sit behind a keyboard to say whatever is on your mind, whether it's right or wrong, is an empowering aspect. And sometimes for the wrong reasons, completely. And the fact that between everything that's been occurring currently, as well as in the past, and, and I'm sure things that will happen in the future we're not aware of just yet, it's either going to get better because people want change, or it's going to be worse because people want to stick with what they know and love. Well said. No, that, 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 that's exactly it. Corollary, <laughs> you were just talking about how, how do we say yeah. it. I also hope it's it's an escape. It's it's a permission to just like have your mind's technicolor vision come to life and everything sparkles and crackles. And I got to talk about the artist, Rob Ahmad. Mm -hmm. um, he's out of England. We got paired up uh, through another artist that I was just talking to here in the States. And they said, you know, you should pitch this to him. I did. Uh, I was nervous too because he, you know, he was definitely in demand at that point. He was busy with a couple of projects already, uh, and then he. We started out with this actually. Um, I mean, I had the whole thing written as a four issue thing, series, but I, my initial idea was like, well, let's start slow with this. Or I am a big fan of in England, 2000 AD, uh, and they and they do like a Future Shock series, which are these like little four page comics. So we tried kind of making it a, a, like an initial kind of chapter of it like that. And in fact, when the collected graphic novel is uh, brought out, you'll get to see that original little mini story in the back of this graphic novel version of Corollary. And that comes out uh, end of September. I don't know if it's kosher for me to be promoting the graphic novel before the series is over, but I just did it. So we, we kind of played around with that and his style was very cerebral, I think mm -hmm. is the best way for me to put it at that point. We just decided, you know what, this needs to be just bombastic and larger than life in every way. And he kind of then went back to page one and we have what we have now, which is, and I say, I don't say this lightly because I know a lot of people feel like this is like, you know, to compare 
I think Rob has a similarity in style to like Batman animated series to some degree. There's that, that quality is there, I think, and the fun that that brings. And not only that, we both decided to experiment with he watercolored by hand the, the first three issues. And I say that because, I, you know, it would be, I, you know, I could kind of white lie and say that he did all four, but painstaking work, gorgeous work. But by the end of the third issue, which took a long, long time, uh, we went to a digital uh, colorist who was able to mimic his watercoloring. So you won't see the difference in the fourth issue. At least I don't, I don't think you will. This watercoloring style. In fact, I think I sent you a page that is an original page um, that I just took a picture of, of without the lettering of DC Hopkins, who's someone else I should definitely be mentioning here. So Rob, he just did some incredible work on this in the growth of, you know, we started this together after I like spent a year writing and polishing, like we've been together on this for like, we were, like for, it was like three years. Like it was started before the pandemic and then just back and forth notes from me, notes back from him, clarifying this and making it what it is that's now on its third issue this week. And yeah, I, I couldn't be happier or prouder of what, what we came up with or, or the work Rob did. When you started putting this script together when, and writing it out here, what was the hardest part for you? Was it the beginning, the middle, or the end for this entire series? Great question. Um, and that changes for all the different things I write. I think for this one, the hardest part was the beginning because of just making sure there's certain major character revelations toward at the end of this first issue. In hand with that challenge is DC Hopkins lettering. And that's something else. I don't think letterers get enough credit for the artistry of their craft, because if it wasn't for DC really being clear and distinct with who is talking when, would this concept behind corollary being vital that we are understanding who's speaking when. So we find out by the end that it turns out Andromeda's sister, technically her body died, but they were able to save her brain. And now they are sharing a body. They take turns. Uh, one is in the body and the other is the then the ship's AI. Well, of course, not really AI, more like organic AI, but they also find out something major in this third issue about this back and forth that they're trying to navigate. That's a huge dilemma for them. And that, as far as my writing, I wanted to make sure it was as clear as humanly possible. And that took making sure I understood who is Andromeda, who is Cass. They have to have a distinct difference in their takes on lives and how they interact with one another. Getting that those voices as clear as I could in the first issue probably was the hardest thing because and then once I had that, the action and those two characters really took over for me. I, I'm the kind of writer that when I'm really invested in a story, uh, the characters really do just run the show for me. And then, yeah, of course, the revision time is painstaking and whatnot, but once I know who they are, I'm able to just kind of let go of the reins a little bit. They bring it, bring it to me. And this really happened uh, once that first issue and who they were and what was, what was their kind of their headbutting and their loving together connection. I, I've heard this often and it's amazing to see that a lot of creative people say that the characters speak to them. If you haven't written a story or if you haven't invested time into your craft as, as a, a writer or creative person in that regard, I think people just think it's as a, a common sentence of an eccentric person. Well, yeah, you know, that's a good point. And I guess the only thing I'd add to my kind of trajectory with writing, I've been writing since high school and college, but I was also doing a lot of uh, sketch comedy. I was, that was my other passion, still is. I'd love to get back to it someday. But sketch comedy, like I, I did some time with the Groundlings, uh, Upright Citizens Forget. I live out in Los Angeles. I lived in New York City before that. I did a lot of live sketch, and you know that that required acting, but also a lot of writing, like creating characters. So not only was I writing these characters back then uh, for little three or five minute scenes, but I was also having to embody them or watch somebody in my sketch comedy group take on some character that I created. And, you know, with sketch comedy, at least hopefully good sketch comedy or good groups, there's also improvisation. 
and good writing and creating good characters in a way I, for me, is improv. I mean, yeah, it's, it's pen to paper, but I'm letting the characters kind of take over, like I said, and that is a form. I mean, maybe that's not accurate. I don't know, but that's how I interpret some of the process I go through. And I think if I didn't have the background that I do in all my years of getting to do improvisation and sketch comedy, I wouldn't be writing the way I do now. I, I mean, it does go hand in hand. The energy into your creative tasks are sometimes difficult, sometimes they're energizing. And it sounds like to me, at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you love writing energizes you as a creative person. 100%. And I can't, I'm like a shark. I mean, I can't, uh, okay, corollary is done. I'll just focus on marketing and putting the word out on this. I've already um, finished uh, another um, mini series script that I'm, I think I'm knock on wood. We're getting going with uh, this wonderful artist, uh, by the name of Magenta King. Uh, he's actually got a, a series out called Jenny Zero with Dark Horse right now. So we're getting going on that. Corollary is a little more on the YA kind of realm. I mean, there is violence in it. I'm not saying this is suitable for an eight-year-old, but 10 to our age and beyond, absolutely. But yeah, there is some violence in Corollary. This next series, uh, mini series or graphic novel I've got is more uh, of the true detective level of R rating. It's a kind of horror uh, mystery noir. But uh, yeah, I can't, I got to keep creating, uh, or at least when I have these like big ideas that just I, my, my passion, as you brought up, is getting be straight behind. Uh, and I'm also proud to say I have a short story, a prose short story that um, I can now say is coming out um, from Pilgrimage Press. They're a literary press from uh, Colorado State University. So I have a short story in their next journal uh, coming out, I think this summer or fall. Well, I guess one other thing I could tell you about down the road here, I did get the chance, uh, Corollary is gonna open some interesting doors and I just finished work on a script, a bio comic about Reba McIntyre. Oh, and nice. that is hopefully gonna be coming out in October. And then way past that, I don't know if I should even bring this up now, but writing the script was amazing and getting hired to do something like that was amazing. I got to write a bio comic about David Grohl. Sweet. Yeah. So though I don't really, I don't have official I, like notices of when they're coming out and all, but that is something that is out in the ether and the artists have it. And, and I'm excited that the opportunity came in. Well, we'll have to have you back on for like a musical segment of, of Reba and David Grohl. I would love that. It was a whole different vibe too. Like bio comics. And it's funny because I do have this other like passionate passion. There's this folk rock blues guy from the early seventies. If any of those genres hit you, even if they don't, I'm telling any listener out there, anyone, I don't care who you are, try this guy he's obscure but his story i mean i'm almost like don't want to share him because i i really do want to get the chance to write kind of a mixture like a fiction blend of and real life of this person named jim sullivan um long story short he like kind of want he was fascinated by ufos and he even wrote an album called ufo and then he told his wife and kid in Malibu, you know what? I'm going to go to Nashville to see if I can make it there because his records didn't take off in California or, or I don't know. He wanted, he thought maybe Nashville. He made it as far as near Area 51, and he just disappeared. So that's just my quick pitch on Jim Sullivan. <laughs> yeah, that that's a completely different episode whatsoever. Um, <laughs> I'm throwing a lot at you, Kurt. The art's beautiful and yeah, talented artist that, that you have for sure. But when you gave the script and you got the art back, what was a scene that you wrote down that looked way better in, in the art form than it did on the page? Oh, wow. Um, that would have to be the work people are opening up to in issue four, which was Guardians of the Galaxy meets Infinity War epic battle characters that get introduced in the end of issue three and in issue four that are a huge important part what's the most misunderstood aspect when you tell someone that you're a writer that maybe isn't in the industry well i would say in the comic book world i what i've come across a lot from people like friends and family that want to support 
and I think this is like a bigger comment too, but like, you know, you have to kind of educate people on what is a floppy 22 page comic versus a graphic novel. A lot of them don't know the difference and that's legitimate. If you're not a regular comic book reader or writer for that matter, and there are a lot of people out there, they, they want to, I think they're intimidated. And you know, I also teach graphic novels and whatnot. And I try, I start right away with talking about the distinction. So I would say that right there, and even just the basics of, okay, so how do I get your comic? I just go into the store and pick one up. Well, that might be true and easy if this is Marvel or DC, but you know, indie comic publishers, it's, you got a, a couple extra steps. So, you know, even talking, a lot of people have never been to their local comic book store. It's a smaller, you know, insular world. We want it to get bigger. And I hope, I'm optimistic that with all this explosion of Marvel and DC in the world, not in like manga just make, taking over as well, both in anime and, you know, I, you know, all of a sudden we have like a live action One Piece coming soon and they're rebooting Avatar as a live action series. So a, I feel like there's a lot of doors opening, even more people are going to be coming into the shops. And that because the comic book shop owner, like my local guy, his name's Ace at Comics vs. Toys and Eagle Rock, incredible guy, always up for me to do a signing, super supportive, especially through the pandemic, like hanging in there, it's a challenge. So I guess back to your original question, just people understanding what is a 22 page floppy comic book versus what's a graphic novel versus what's a mini series versus if they want to get something digitally, there's just a lot going on there that a people aren't going to know off the bat or, or even, you know, what is a pull list? So, you know, I have people that, well, I got issue one, no problem, but I had to challenge getting issue three. Well, the, the store was out of it. Well, did you tell them you wanted the series? Like you got it, it, it has to be spelled out. <laughs> That's a learning situation. I'm just aware that just because I've been getting comics at my local comic book stores, since I could get a ride from my parents till today, every Wednesday. And yes, I know now it's Tuesdays too, because is it DC or Marvel or both of them that have gone to different distributors? And that's a whole other thing. Like who cares about that kind of thing other than people that are in the industry and love comics the way we do? I mean, I don't, my parents are not going to be like, oh, you mean DC's now Tuesdays? And I, I better write that down. I mean, that's just crazy. There's a lot to explain and you can't get frustrated with what people don't know. It's like anything that's that's new that people don't understand. They they have to know the basics in order to understand the culture that comes around the medium that they're trying to engage in. Right on. And I think the comic book medium is one of the most amazing creations of uh, the United States. I mean, I say that because you know, it kind of came up around the same time as jazz. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I mean, and then similarly coming up in the East with, with manga. And then of course, every, all the European comics, it just, it's, but it, it's a beautiful art form. And I think it does make sense that it did kind of explode onto the scene at the same time that jazz did. I mean, if you look at the parallels of the art forms, there's a lot to say like that. What happens in the gutters of your panel to panel, that is jazz. That is getting in your reader's brain and letting them riff. You could have a character like flying with a jetpack in space. And then in the next panel, they got like hit by some blast of energy from this giant hairy uh, looking toad. And you filled in their mind what that hairy toad shot them with in that gutter. It's amazing. That goes back to, um, you know, comics like Buck Rogers and everything like that, where, you know, you're, you're looking or Flash Gordon for that matter, or the sci-fi that a lot of us are either revisiting now or, or grew up on way back when. So, and then of course, Star Wars and Star Trek as well, among, I'm sure thousands of others that <laughs> we're not quite aware of that are popular in other countries. It's the, the different abilities to be flexible in, in the medium of comic books, because I think comic books next to, well, comic books are probably the most flexible medium there is because you, ha you have, the only limit is the amount of pages and your imagination, I think. That's right. No, and I will say this, SourcePoint Press was really cool with me because I kind of begged and they didn't put up a stink. A couple of issues are more than 22. Uh, in fact, issues three and four are 24 and 25 pages. So 
I did cheat a little bit on that. Could I have kept it at tight 22? Yes. But the fact that they said, yes, we want you to go big, go big. And I just added to the story, literally and just figuratively. We haven't talked about Sourcepoint Press yet. And of course, they're an amazing publisher out of, out of Detroit, out of Michigan, I should say. I'm familiar with a lot of their uh, current stable of people, uh, Dirk Manning, among others as well, too. And and I believe Rayleigh Grant uh, in that yeah. regard as well, too, just because my memory is horrible right now. How did they approach you or you approach them regarding Corollary? It was a courtship. It was pre-pandemic. I had a, com- I had a graphic novel come out through Marcosia Press. They're in a British press uh, called Playground Attack of the Girl Robots, which was a not just all ages, but like a middle grade graphic novel about a kid who's on the playground and every childhood game he plays is real. Like he gets, if he plays freeze tag, he can freeze you. If he plays Simon Says, you're compelled to do what he wants. And I, so I had this in hand because it had been out for about a year and I met uh, some of the people uh, at Source Point at their booth. I believe it was at um, LA Comic Con, uh, like the year before the pandemic. And I told them about that. I want I had some other stories that I wanted to pitch. I gave them a copy of Playground just to show them what I've been up to. And they said, yeah, you know, send us what you got when you're, you got some pages with your artist. It sounds like a cool idea. And that's um, where it started. Once uh, Rob had the pages ready, like those first eight pages, um, the source point, like Josh and Cameron, they were like, they were all over it. They were totally supportive and they were great with the feedback. And they gave me permission too, like, but you know, when they saw those watercolors for the first time, I was like, oh yeah, I think this could be a different way to go. And they were like all aboard. They're like, yeah. And initially I was like, well, maybe just only certain times where their, you know, their mood is a certain way. And they were like right there, like, no, let's go all in on this. This is unique. This is not being done. And it, it just worked for the story. It sounds like they're giving you the flexibility to be as creative as you need to be while still being a consistent publisher that they are. You know, the fact that they let me break that 22 page rule in two of the issues was, was awesome. Uh, early on, they got me some um, great interviews for the first issue even came out. They had a lot of advice as far as, just, you know, getting the word out myself. And they were very like, you know, they're always ready to like just social media wise blast information out. And they are just um, juggernauts as far as going to cons. I think they are at one right now, but they are just chugging along it all over like the Midwest south southeast you name it and i'm hoping knock on wood to get up to uh, emerald con in seattle i've never been to it um but i'd love to get to be there and i think they are gonna have a booth up there and issue four will have been out by for a while then as well as announcing uh the collected graphic novel edition with all the bonus material it's impressive like i've been loving so, like I, and you brought up ryland i mean i've been loving his his work out of there suicide jockeys um it's oh, just yeah. been a lot of fun and he we live in the same neighborhood and I you know my comic book shop owner Ace kind of introduced us and Ryland's just been amazing about meeting for coffee uh or social distance at that time when we first got to know each other you asked like you know before we got on on this what's a, you know any stories about meeting and well I'll tell you so very early in us knowing each other after he was incredibly generous with his advice and whatnot my son goes to the local dojo. He's in karate and he's already uh, an adult purple belt. And he's only 12. And Ryland decided he wanted to get back into karate. I think he's been doing martial arts. And my son's been for the last couple of years saying, dad, you should try it with me. And so I, and Ryland's like, yeah, you should. And he was there that day and he was beyond excited to spar with me. And I didn't know that would be happening. You know, Kurt, here's the thing. Uh, this was an intense experience for me because all of a sudden here I am with a guy that I'm friends with, you know, I'd say, yes, at this point, we're more than acquaintances. He is not holding back, um, with like, you know, we have our pads on. I mean, I wasn't getting like hurt, but I haven't been like punched since I was 10 or something, you know, or I don't know. I mean, I just, as a, here I am, I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like in like 10 minutes of sparring with another adult grown man who's what they're doing. And it was, I mean, the afterwards, my adrenaline, I was like both nauseous. I, I, I couldn't sleep that night. 
the next day I hurt in places I didn't know were possible to hurt. Yeah. You know, this kind of actually connects to what you were talking about is just what does it mean to be a writer or just any kind of artist? Like, I think when exploring things that are out of your comfort zone, yeah. you got to keep doing it. There's no age limit on that. And this was that for me. Am I going to do it again? Yes. I saw, I promised my son that um, I would go back to the dojo, but am I scared of getting hurt? Yes, I am. <laughs> it, it was wild. And yeah, Ryland did not... Uh, he, maybe he would say he was gentle with me. I don't know, but he definitely got some good shots in, and I don't know if I got any shots in. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll ask him next time he's on. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was the point system regarding your your sparring match with Adam there? I'll I'll ask him that question. <laughs> yeah, please do, please do. <laughs> uh, no, for me it was um, I did about ten years of Japanese jiu-jitsu, so a lot of throws and punches and kicks and oh, everything nice. like that. So, I I love. I love it. Um, I'll have to go back. My sensei is out of Nova Scotia, so I have to I have to head up that way and, and kind of get back into it. But um, there's nothing like it. I mean, you're you're active in in not only spiritually in a sense, yeah. uh, but mentally you you kind of reset yourself if you have had a bad day or whatever, and and it kind of gets you focused in on you know what's what's the task in front of me rather than you know what's all this noise in the background that you know I, I I'm worrying stupidly over. You know? No, I couldn't agree more. Like, that's why I, I really do think I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a real chance, uh, and I'm just gonna you know I'll I'll back off if I feel like I'm about to have my pinky broken. <laughs> <laughs> well, because as long as you have your other eight, nine fingers working, <laughs> I think that works out, right? You can still tell. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah, I've, social media, Ryland, he was great about a lot of advice and just, you know, putting me in touch with you was beyond appreciative. I'm like really honored to be, get to be on your show. And he was just great about telling me about, you know, just in like our Los Angeles area, reaching out to certain shops about signings and and getting the word out to different stores across the country or, you know, the value in like, cold calling people and all that stuff. So he still continues to be someone uh, that has been a huge resource for me. Next question I have here is, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I guess I have like the first thing that comes to mind, this project. And at the, at the time, it's, it felt like the most tedious middle school project you could imagine and i feel like today kids would look at you as if that was barbaric but my seventh grade english teacher had this thing called scraptionary and he made us all for like we had three months to do it but he had like you had to find like this long long list of really big vocab words like acrimonious innuendo you name it and you had to find them in periodicals like newsweek time magazine newspapers whatever and then you had to painstakingly cut the word out in the sentence or paragraph you found it in. And then you had to paste it into your scrapbook with the definition. And then you had to write your own sentence about it. Uh, it was intense, but it certainly gave me the power of words and language on it just on that small, small frame. But then if you want to go a little bigger, I think uh, I really felt like doors opened up for the power of language to me later in high school when I like I took a course. Now I'm gonna say the name of this course and nowadays, you know, this person definitely has kind of dug themselves into a pit, but at this point, nobody knew about their history. I took an elective English course on Woody Allen. And then after, you know, we read it like, he had a lot of collections of short stories without feathers, side effects. And I was like, I can't believe I'm getting to just like read this one person's work. And then we were asked to like write our own short stories and just the freedom that that gave me. And I just remember like writing like this one story that like was just so, you know, nowadays, yeah, you know, I'm sure I'd roll my eyes if I read it today, but then it just felt like this amazing opportunity and like just having the chance to bounce ideas off of other kids and the teacher was so supportive. It was amazing. Everyone asks, you know, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've received in your career? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received in your career that has stuck with you? Oh, wow. The second. Okay. I would say yes and. 
And that goes back to what I said before about like improvisation and sketch comedy. Um, and I think there's a, you know, we could dig deep into the philosophy behind just, you have to give yourself permission. You cannot, maybe this, maybe I'm cheating here and this is the, fir the first big piece of advice, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pretend it's the second. Uh, you can't edit yourself. Save that for when you finish whatever this story is, get it out and then go back. Now, some people might have a different process, but that was advice I took to heart. Yes, and. If you say no, if I were to say, hey, Kurt, we're gonna be late for our flight on the rocket ship to the moon, and instead you said, Adam, what? no, we're not going to the moon. You just stop the action, Kurt. So now we gotta start a whole new scene. But if instead I said, hey, Kurt, we're gonna be late for our flight to the moon, and you said, Sure, why not? <laughs> and I'd say, okay, I'm going to pack some cheese because I don't know if the moon really has it. You know, now I'm being ridiculous and super eye rolling. But my point is, we got to say yes to each other. And you got to say yes to yourself as a writer. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? In one way, my parents inspired me, I guess, just with kind of saying, just take chances, get out of your comfort zone try new things from an early age. So that, as far as just core things that I really took to heart, like I really took them seriously about all of that. That's one side of it. But then as far as actual like writers that maybe um, really grabbed me, I'd say one in particular, this is going to maybe seem out of left field to some degree, but Cormac McCarthy, uh, Blood Meridian, when I first read that book, and that, that came later, like that was like, you know, I was in my early 20s or whatever, but I couldn't believe his command of language in that book. Similarly, uh, Confederacy of Dunces, another novel that just blew my mind at what someone could create with just words. And then into the realm of graphic novels, I would have to say that I mean, Watchmen really did like tell me that there's a whole world out there that was not tapped into until I read that comic or that graphic novel. So in Mouse, um, but then even more, re you know, then a little bit after that, just Grant Morrison and Animal Man and, Sw and then out, you know, Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. Frank Quitely, uh, speaking of Grant Morrison, but like All-Star Superman and then later J Jupiter's Legacy, Jupiter's Legacy with Frank Miller. I mean, that was stuff that just made my hair stand up with excitement. And seeing these, like these masters create these beautiful stories with like just incredible language and art. Uh, really opened my mind up to what is possible and why this medium is so incredible. From a professional standpoint, you are a published author, writer, as well as comic book writer. You are finishing, of course, Corollary uh, series, mini series, I should say, and it is being sold and published by uh, SourcePoint Press. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Wow, I consider myself successful as far as commitment to my craft, to my love uh, of creating. And, you know, I, do I have my times where I'm like, gosh, I really wish that rejection didn't hurt so much? Yeah, I do. But that just feeds me. Like, I guess I feel successful because every time I do get that time to write, the escape and the joy that I feel in that process is still very strong with me. If I ever like were to come into come to it and be phoning it in, then I'm done. Uh, then I know that you know I am not successful because I my heart's not in it anymore. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Ah, well, it hurts. Um, but I am someone that strongly believes it took some time to get to this, but just I need to learn from my failures. I need to grow. I need to constantly be honing my, my craft because I've been writing comic book scripts for like the last 15 years. Doesn't mean I have nothing new to learn. In fact, I just read scripting for comic books. I think it's Alan David. I'm so bad with names sometimes. Or Alan David, Al Davis, incredible book. There was things that I, knew, I already knew in it, but it was like so many things I didn't. Like Brian Michael Bendis wrote this, like kind of how to make comics book that was amazing. And of course, like I, I still go back to like the, the Bibles of the Scott, all three of the Scott McCloud books. Failure is something that 
it, it stings, but then I got to look at it and see what I can learn. And I have, I, I feel like I've come a long way. I think, uh, am I happy with like what, like that graphic novel playground attack of the gurgle bots that I mentioned to you before? Yes, but that one, you know, that, that, that was my first kind of publishing comic book success, but I learned a lot in that process. And I built on that with Corollary, with other projects that I'm still, I still have, I'm working on, as I mentioned before. So yeah, I'm always trying to grow from any kind of rejection or failure. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with your kid is going to be amazing to see what he does creatively in the future, whether it's as a writer or whether it's as maybe something completely different, who knows what the future may hold. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Wow, that is a huge, amazing question. And I think beyond important. And I don't want to get it wrong, um, but I probably will. You know, my, my son is 12. My daughter is nine. And I am always uh, hopefully telling them to take chances to, to just to whatever they find themselves passionate about to, to go for it. And as far as how can they influence the next generation or, or yeah, the next group of young kids built behind them? Uh, I think number one is kindness. Believe it or not, I think that's something, maybe some people think that goes without saying, but I think uh, as a society, as a world, we need a lot more of it now more than ever. And we need to have our ears open. We need to listen. And I think that is a skill um, we're losing to some degree. So I guess, another, you know, and this maybe this is a little too tangential, but you know, I do get concerned that like people like, you know, growing up now with phones and like you and I are like the last uh, of human beings that didn't have that at the age of nine in our hands or 12. And I think educating them on just that does connect to your question. Like you need to be able to make eye contact with people still. You need to be able to listen to them. And we got to get out of our silos. That's I guess that's the, other, the last thing I'd say. You gotta, you know, you, you might know. Oh, well, I like this, this, and this, so I only go to these three places for everything that I consume. You gotta branch out. You gotta see what else is out there. You gotta open your ears and your mind. If your life was a comic book or a movie, what would its title be? And since you've done biopic comics as well too, uh, what would its soundtrack? Be? Oof, and I love soundtracks. Yeah, that's one thing I wish I did for Corollary. Not that it's too late, but I'd make a, like a playlist for it. I've been a soundtrack person since I was a kid. Like Ghostbusters, Beverly Hills Cop. Oh, yeah. like those are like my first albums. That and stand-up comedy, like Rodney Dangerfield. But oh, yeah. the title of my movie, the overwhelming yet satisfying trials and tribulations of a man drifting but still afloat. Sounds like a Woody Allen title. Well, I got it. I mean, one that I listen to incessantly, especially if I'm like feeling like I really need to get in that writing mode. Cause I do, I enjoy music when I'm writing. This particular soundtrack has been a go-to for me forever. And that's the big Lebowski. Oh, yeah. I love the music on that from the instrumental to the pop, you know, seventies, eighties, whatever, nineties music. I love the music. From top to bottom, there isn't a track on there that I skip. It, the sound itself, I guess what makes that such a beautiful one to me, and again, there's a lot of other good ones out there, but that one, it's like every song, I see the scene. If I were to make one for Corollary, I would want you to see the scene uh, with each of the songs that I would choose. It's funny, you're kind of like re-sparking re that idea for me because I could still do it for Corollary. And that's the thing, like, I, mean, I have like, zero followers on Spotify. So oh, I'd be doing it for myself, but sure, I could I could definitely do it because I do love that. I, soundtracks, I'm glad you brought them up because yeah, I think they're so important. That would be a gig, a creative gig I would go over the moon for. Like I wonder like the people that, you know, normally you hear about composers, but are there people that don't actually know how to write music, but then just get, or is that just the director? I, I don't know, maybe that's another show, Kurt. That we can talk about, but now you're giving me too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough on my plate as it is. 
Uh, well, I do hate to say this, Adam, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I do want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. This was a blast. I did breeze by. It was really fun talking to you. Where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find Corollary and any other future works that you may be um, promoting? Uh, no, thanks for asking. I guess number one's Twitter is uh, at AdamRose74. I also am on uh, Instagram, and that's uh, at Shazam Cap, uh, S-H-A-Z-A-M-C-A-P. I got it before the Shazam movie came out, so lucky me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like source point, I mean, we have issue four has just rolled out on July 20th. And then eventually there'll be, maybe it's um, kind of putting the cart before the horse, but the collected edition with a lot of awesome bonus materials. I actually just got this cool pinup artwork from a, this amazing artist is going to be available at the end of September. And I'm hoping to be at Emerald Con uh, in August. Uh, and I'll announce that officially if it does happen at, at the Source Point booth. And yeah, if you like short stories, like not comic related, but just a good short story, I have one coming out in Pilgrimage Press out of uh, uh, their literary journal out of Colorado State uh, later this summer. Well, Adam, thanks again for coming to this show. I greatly appreciate it. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website, I'm trying to do what I can to update the website now, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking. Thank you.